The 18th plenary meeting of the General Assembly is called to order. The Assembly will hear this morning a statement by the President of the United States of America. I request the Chief of Protocol to escort His Excellency Mr. Jimmy Carter into the hall. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome to the United Nations His Excellency Mr. Jimmy Carter, President of the United States of America, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, assembled delegates and distinguished guests. Mr. President, I wish to offer first my congratulations on your election as President of the 32nd General Assembly. It gives my own government particular satisfaction to work under the leadership of a representative from, Yugo from Yugoslavia, a nation with which the United States enjoys close and valued relations. We pledge our cooperation and will depend heavily on your experience and skill in guiding these discussions which we are beginning. Mr. President, I would also like to express again the high esteem in which we hold Secretary General Waldheim. We continue to benefit greatly from our close consultations with him and we place great trust in his leadership of this organization. 32 years ago, in the cold dawn of the atomic age, this organization came into being. Its first and its most urgent purpose has been to secure peace for an exhausted and ravaged world. Present conditions in some respects appear quite hopeful, yet the assurance of peace continues to elude us. Before the end of this century, a score of nations could possess nuclear weapons. If this should happen, the world that we leave our children will mock our own hopes for peace. The level of nuclear armaments could grow by tens of thousands, and the same situation could well occur with advanced conventional weapons. The temptation to use these weapons, or fear that someone else might do it first, would be almost irresistible. The ever-growing trade in conventional arms subverts international commerce from a force for peace to a caterer for war. Violence, terrorism, assassination, undeclared wars, all threaten to destroy the restraint and the moderation that must become the dominant characteristic of our age. Unless we establish a code of international behavior in which, we res in which the resort to violence becomes increasingly irrelevant to the pursuit of national interest, we will crush the world's dreams for human development and the full flowering of human freedom. We have already become a global community, but only in the sense that we face common problems and we share 
for good or evil, a common future. In this community, power to solve the world's problems, particularly economic and political power, no longer lies solely in the hands of a few nations. Power is now widely shared among many nations with different cultures and different histories and different aspirations. The question is whether we will allow our differences to defeat us or whether we will work together to realize our common hopes for peace. Today, I want to address the major dimensions of peace and the role the United States intends to play in limiting and reducing all armaments, controlling nuclear technology, restricting the arms trade, and settling disputes by peaceful means. When atomic weapons were used for the first time, Winston Churchill described the power of the atom as, quote, a revelation long mercifully withheld from man. Since then, we have learned in Durand Mott's chilling words that what has once been thought can never be unthought. If we are to have any assurance that our children are to live out their lives in a world which satisfies our hope or that they will have a chance to live at all, we must finally come to terms with this enormous nuclear force and turn it exclusively to beneficial ends. Peace will not be assured until the weapons of war are finally put away. While we work toward that goal, nations will want sufficient arms to preserve their security. The United States' purpose is to ensure peace. It is for that reason that our military posture and our alliances will remain as strong as necessary to deter attack. However, the security of the, of the global community cannot forever rest on a balance of terror. In the past, war has been accepted as the ultimate arbiter of disputes among nations. But in the nuclear era, we can no longer think of war as merely a continuation of diplomacy by other means. Nuclear war cannot be measured by the archaic standards of victory or defeat. This stark reality imposes on the United States and the Soviet Union an awesome and special responsibility. The United States is engaged along with other nations in a broad range of negotiations. In strategic arms limitation talks, we and the Soviets are within sight of a significant agreement in limiting the total numbers of weapons and in restricting certain categories of weapons of special concern to each of us. We can also start the crucial process of curbing the relentless march of technological development, which makes nuclear weapons ever more difficult to control. We must look beyond the present and work to prevent the critical threats and instabilities of the future. In the principles of self-restraint, reciprocity, and mutual accommodation of interest, if these are observed, then the United States and the Soviet Union will not only succeed in limiting weapons, but will also create a foundation of better relations in other spheres of interest. The United States is willing to go as far as possible, consistent with our security interest in limiting and reducing our nuclear weapons. On a reciprocal basis, we are willing now to reduce them by 10 percent or 20 percent even 50 percent, then we will work for further reductions to a world truly free of nuclear weapons. The United States also recognizes a threat 
of continued testing of nuclear explosives. Negotiations for a comprehensive ban on nuclear explosions are now being conducted by the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Soviet Union. As in other areas where vital national security interests are engaged, agreements must be verifiable and fair. They must be seen by all the parties as serving a longer-term interest that justifies the restraints of the moment. The longer-term interest in this instance is to close one more avenue of nuclear competition and thereby demonstrate to all the world that the major nuclear powers take seriously our obligations to reduce the threat of nuclear catastrophe. My country believes that the time has come to end all explosions of nuclear devices, no matter what their claimed justification, peaceful or military. And we appreciate the efforts of other nations to reach this same goal. During the past nine months, I have expressed the special importance that we attach to controlling nuclear proliferation. But I fear that many do not understand why the United States feels as it does. Why is it so important to avoid the chance that one or two or 10 other nations might acquire one or two or 10 nuclear weapons of their own? Let me try to explain, for I deeply believe that this is one of the greatest challenges that we face in the next quarter of a century. It's a truism that nuclear weapons are a powerful deterrent. They are a deterrent because they threaten. They could be used for terrorism or blackmail as well as for war. But they threaten not just the intended enemy. They threaten every nation, combatant or non-combatant alike. That is why all of us must be concerned. Let me be frank. The existence of nuclear weapons in the United States and the Soviet Union, in Great Britain, France, and China, is something that we cannot undo. We accept by the painstaking process of negotiation. But the existence of these weapons does not mean that other nations need to develop their own weapons any more than it provides a reason for those of us who have them to share them with others. Rather, it imposes two solemn obligations on the nations which have the capacity to export nuclear fuel and nuclear technology. The obligations to meet legitimate energy needs, and in doing so, to ensure that nothing that we export contributes directly or indirectly to the production of nuclear explosives. That is why the supplier nations are seeking a common policy. And that is why the United States and the Soviet Union, even as we struggle to find common ground in the SALT talks, have already moved closer toward agreement and cooperation in our efforts to limit nuclear proliferation. I believe that the London Suppliers Group must conclude its work as it's presently constituted so that the world security will be safeguarded from the pressures of commercial competition. We have learned that it is not enough to safeguard just some facilities or some materials. Full scope Comprehensive safeguards are necessary. Two weeks from now, in our own country, more than 30 supplier and consuming nations will convene for the International Fuel Cycle Evaluation, which we proposed last spring. For the next several years, experts will work together on every facet of the nuclear fuel cycle. The scientists and the policymakers of these nations will face 
a tremendous challenge. We know that by the year 2000, nuclear power reactors could be producing enough plutonium to make tens of thousands of bombs every year. I believe, from my own personal knowledge of this issue, that there are all ways to solve the problems that we face. I believe that there are alternative fuel cycles that can be managed safely on a global basis. I hope, therefore, that the International Fuel Cycle Evaluation will have the support and the encouragement of every nation. I've heard it said that efforts to control nuclear proliferation are futile, that the genie is already out of the bottle. I do not believe this to be true. It should not be forgotten that for 25 years, the nuclear club did not expand its membership. By genuine cooperation, we can make certain that this terrible club expands no further. Now, I've talked about the special problems of nuclear arms control and nuclear proliferation at length. Let me turn to the problem of conventional arms control, which affects potentially or directly every nation represented in this great hall. This is not a matter for the future, even the near future, but of the immediate present. Worldwide military expenditures are now in the neighborhood of $300 billion a year. Last year, the nations of the world spent more than 60 times as much, 60 times as much, equipping each soldier as we spent educating each child. The industrial nation spent the most money, but the rate of growth in military spending is faster in the developing world. While only a handful of states produce sophisticated weapons, the number of nations which seek to purchase these weapons is expanding rapidly. The conventional arms race both causes and feeds on the threat of larger and more deadly wars. It levies an enormous burden on an already troubled world economy. For our part, the United States has now begun to reduce its arms exports. Our aim is to reduce both the quantity and the deadliness of the weapons that we sell. We have already taken the first few steps, but we cannot go very far alone. Nations whose neighbors are purchasing large quantities of arms feel constrained to do the same. Supplier nations who practice restraint in arms sales sometimes find that they simply lose valuable commercial markets to other suppliers. We hope to work with other supplier nations to cut back on the flow of arms and to reduce the rate at which the most advanced and sophisticated weapon technologies spread around the world. We do not expect this task to be easy or to produce instant results, but we are committed to stop the spiral of increasing sale of weapons. Equally important, we hope that purchaser nations individually and through regional organizations will limit their arms imports we are ready to provide to some nations the necessary means for legitimate self-defense, but we are also eager to work with any nation or region in order to decrease the need for more numerous, more deadly, and ever more expensive weapons. Fourteen years ago, one of my predecessors spoke in this very room under circumstances that in certain ways resembled these. It was a time, he said, of comparative calm, and there was an atmosphere of rising hope about the prospect of controlling nuclear energy. The first specific step had been taken 
to limit the nuclear arms race. A test ban treaty signed by nearly 100 nations. But the succeeding years did not live up to the optimistic prospect John F. Kennedy placed before this assembly. Because as a community of nations, we failed to address the deepest sources of potential conflict among us. As we seek to establish the principles of detente among the major nuclear powers, we believe that these principles must also apply in regional conflicts. The United States is committed to the peaceful settlement of differences. We are committed to the strengthening of the peacemaking capabilities of the United Nations and regional organizations such as the Organization of African Unity and the Organization of American States. The United States supports Great Britain's effort to bring about a peaceful, rapid transition to majority rule and independence in Zimbabwe. We have joined other members of the Security Council last week and also the Secretary General in efforts to bring about independence and democratic rule in Namibia. We are pleased with the level of cooperation that we have achieved with the leaders of the nations in the area, as well as those peoples who are struggling for independence. We urge South Africa and other nations to support the proposed solution to the problems in Zimbabwe and to cooperate still more closely in providing for a smooth and prompt transition in Namibia. But it is essential that all outside nations exercise restraint in their actions in Zimbabwe and Namibia so that we can bring about this majority rule and avoid a widening war that could engulf the southern half of the African continent. Of all the regional conflicts in the world, none holds more menace than the Middle East. War there has already carried the world to the edge of nuclear confrontation. It has already disrupted the world economy and imposed severe hardships on the people in the developed and the developing nations alike. So true peace, peace embodied in binding treaties is essential. It will be in the interest of the Israelis and the Arabs. It is in the interest of the American people. It is in the interest of the entire world. The United Nations Security Council has provided the basis for peace in resolutions 242 and 338, but negotiations in good faith by all parties is needed to give substance to peace. Such good faith negotiations must be inspired by a recognition that all nations in the area, Israel and the Arab countries, have a right to exist in peace with early establishment of economic and cultural exchange and of normal diplomatic relations. Peace must include a process in which the bitter divisions of generations, even centuries, hatreds and suspicions can be overcome. Negotiations cannot be successful if any of the parties harbor the deceitful view that peace is simply an interlude in which to prepare for war. Good faith negotiations will also require acceptance by all sides of the fundamental rights and interests of everyone involved. For Israel, this means borders that are recognized and secure. Security arrangements are crucial to a nation that has fought for its survival in each of the last four decades. The commitment of the United States to Israel's security is unquestionable. For the Arabs, the legitimate rights of the, Panamanian, of the Palestinian people must be recognized. 
One of the things that binds the American people to Israel is our shared respect for human rights and the courage with which Israel has defended such rights. It is clear that a true and lasting peace in the Middle East must also respect the rights of all people of the area. How these rights are to be defined and implemented is, of course, for the interested parties to decide in detailed negotiations and not for us to dictate. We do not intend to impose from the outside a settlement on the nations of the Middle East. The United States has been meeting with the foreign ministers of Israel and the Arab nations involved in the search for peace. We are staying in close contact with the Soviet Union, with whom we share responsibility for reconvening the Geneva Conference. As a result of these consultations, the Soviet Union and the United States have agreed to call for the resumption of the Geneva Conference before the end of this year. While a number of procedural questions remain, if the parties continue to act in good faith, I believe that these questions can be answered. The major powers have a special responsibility to act with restraint in areas of the world where they have competing interests because the association of these interests with local rivalries and conflicts can lead to serious confrontation. In the Indian Ocean area, neither we nor the Soviet Union has a large military presence, nor is there a rapidly mounting competition between us. Restraint in the area may well begin with a mutual effort to stabilize our presence and to avoid an escalation in military competition. Then both sides can consider how our military activities in the Indian Ocean, this whole area might be even further reduced. The peaceful settlement of differences is, of course, essential. The United States is willing to abide by that principle, as in the case of the recently signed Panama Canal Treaties. Once ratified, these treaties can transform the U.S.-Panama relationship into one that permanently protects the interest and respects the sovereignty of both our countries. We have all survived and surmounted major challenges since the United Nations was founded. But we can accelerate progress, even in a world of ever-increasing diversity. A commitment to strengthen international institutions is vital, but progress lies also in our own national policies. We can work together to form a community of peace if we accept the kind of obligations that I have suggested today. To summarize, first, an obligation to remove the threat of nuclear weaponry, to reverse the buildup of armaments and their trade, and to conclude bilateral and multilateral arms control agreements that can bring security to all of us. In order to reduce the reliance of nations on nuclear weaponry, I hereby solemnly declare on behalf of the United States that we will not use nuclear weapons except in self-defense. That is, in circumstances of an actual nuclear or conventional attack on the United States, our territories, or armed forces, or such an attack on our allies. In addition, we hope that initiatives by the Western nations to secure mutual and balanced force reductions in Europe will be met by equal response from the Warsaw Pact countries. Second, an obligation to show restraint in areas of tension, to negotiate disputes and settle them peacefully, and to strengthen peacemaking capabilities of the United Nations and regional organizations. And finally, an effort by all nations 
east as well as west, north as well as south, to fulfill mankind's aspirations for human development and human freedom. It is to meet these basic demands that we build governments and seek peace. We must share these obligations for our own mutual survival and our own mutual prosperity. We can see a world at peace. We can work for a world without want. We can build a global community dedicated to these purposes and to human dignity. The view that I have sketched for you today is that of only one leader in only one nation. However wealthy and powerful the United States may be, however capable of leadership, this power is increasingly only relative. The leadership increasingly is in need of being shared. No nation has a monopoly of vision, of creativity, or of ideas. Bringing these together from many nations is our common responsibility and our common challenge. For only in these ways can the idea of a peaceful global community grow and prosper. Thank you very much. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank His Excellency, the President of the United States of America, Jimmy Carter, for the important statement he has just made. May I request representatives to remain seated while the Secretary General and I escort His Excellency, the President of the United States. Mr. President, these are the international civil servants who are citizens of the United States that do so much to make the United Nations system work. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Thank you very much. In case you're wondering additionally who I am, I'm the one that works for Andy Young.
I know it's not appropriate for me to charge you with a special responsibility just to our own great nation alone because in a special way you represent the United States in an expanded role. You work in the international community, which we were very grateful to have come with its headquarters to our free country. In the past years, there has been, I think, a constant growth in the influence of the United Nations. And more and more, there has been a realization that without the UN, there could be no resolution of many regional disputes and problems and the realization of hopes that if thwarted, could possibly even embroil our own country in warfare quite unnecessarily. I myself have a deep commitment to the United Nations and want to see its role expanded in the future. The world is too complex to be dealt with even as well as in the past by one powerful country or three or four powerful countries. The other nations of the world resent it. And it's much better to have a forum where each nation's voice can be heard. I want to say also that there's a special reason for the UN to be in our country. This kind of a kinship that sometimes goes unrecognized. Because our nation, for the last 200 years, has in effect done what the United Nations has done in the last 32 years. There's hardly a country represented in this body now or its predecessors that don't have citizens who've come to our own country to learn how to get along with one another, to share religious compatibilities and differences, to compare social compatibilities and differences, to share past political compatibilities and differences. Those who've been mortal enemies in the heart of Europe or in Africa or other parts of the world, when they come here to our country to be citizens, they've had to learn to live in harmony. And at the same time, they've also preserved their own precious heritage in a unique and very proud and effective way. The foundation of the United Nations, as you know, is similar to our own. The charter of the United Nations, signed in 1945, I believe, has as its basic premise individual freedom, the reaching for a higher capacity for human life, existence with the worth of each human protected, a search for equality of opportunity. These kinds of bases, not coincidentally, exist in both our own Constitution and Declaration of Independence and in the United Nations Charter. I think it's accurate to say that there is a growing realization that the United Nations is accepted better by the American people. It hasn't always been a fact that the UN could take the major responsibility in a potential troubled spot like Namibia and retain that role, deal with uh, South Africa, deal with SWAPO, deal with the other nations in Southern Africa, deal with the other parts of the world who are interested. And I know that as far as our own uh, role is concerned, in Zimbabwe, we and the British are very eager to see the United Nations come in and play a larger and larger role. Just the prevention of war is certainly not enough, but the enhancement of education opportunities, better health care for the people of the world, a searching out of commerce, dealing with the laws of the seas and elimination of racism, and many other of the most complicated 
and challenging confrontations with human beings are now being channeled more and more into the United Nations. I know that you are searching, along with others who administer the UN, for a better way to spend the limited amount of money that's available to you. And the organization of the structure of the United Nations is being re-examined. And this is compatible with governments throughout the world. I'd like to say, in closing, that I personally am deeply indebted to you. We have a fine delegation at the United Nations. Without any derogation at all to past ambassadors here, I want to say that I'm extremely proud of what Andrew Young is, what he means, what he says, what he does, what he stands for. In my opinion, he epitomizes, in many ways, the greatness of our own country. And the new harmonious relationship that now exists between our own country and some of the developing nations of the world can be credited directly to the influence of Andrew Young and the trust that those deprived people have in him. He's one of those Americans whose ancestors came here perhaps uh, involuntarily, but you could <laughs> but you can see how well he's done. <laughs> and I'm very glad politically to have him on my side. But I think this does uh, illustrate very clearly what our country is and what it's made of itself and what the United Nations is and what it is making of itself. Because some of the finest expressions of hope and commitment in the international community have not yet been realized. Many of our realizations were slow in coming. As you well know, when our country was founded, there was a premise that slavery was accepted, although we were founded on a basis of equality and freedom. And it's been in recent years that women had a right to vote and young people had a right to vote and we could elect our United States senators directly and so forth. Our country has grown with the last two centuries experience and we still have a long way to go before we can assure that the future of the international community will be based on peace and that people with diverse interests can indeed live with mutual respect and in harmony. I came here as a candidate to speak about the proliferation of nuclear weapons and I came back last spring as a new president to speak about human rights. And I came here again this morning to speak about the elimination of a threat of war. And so I think I've already demonstrated my deep commitment to the institution which you serve so well. So I'm proud of you. And I hope that my own administration, our United Nations delegation, our State Department, and other aspects of it will make you proud. I think as we deal with the North-South questions, which is one of the most difficult of all, it's accurate to say that we've had similar struggle within the United States too. And perhaps I've proven that if you struggle long enough, the Southerners don't have to worry about eventually uh, coming out on top. So we've got a long way to go. We'll go that together. And I hope that we can learn as a nation from the harmony in the United Nations, and I hope that your organization, the United Nations, can also learn from the great experience of what I still consider to be the greatest country on earth, the United States. Thank you very much.